Namaste. Amen and blessed be. Today we're going to explore one of the most famous essays in theology. And it actually comes from a Unitarian, Ralph Waldo Emerson. I'm turning to this essay called The Oversoul because this month, as you probably know, we're exploring mystery as our theme. And we tend to think of mystery as the unknown frontier out there in the darkness. It's beyond what we can see or possibly what we can even read about. There's a lot of mystery still out there to be uncovered and understood. But there's also still a lot of mystery in here to explore. Though it's quite old, I think Ralph Waldo Emerson's description of the soul speaks beautifully to that mystery that we're exploring this month. In this one essay, The Oversoul, he covers a tremendous amount of religious thought. It's totally overwhelming. But even more impressive than his ideas are probably the poetry that he puts into describing them. It's something that any religious leader would aspire to today. So, in our exploration of mystery, I thought it would be fun to dive into this great essay a little bit and explore it for our lives here today. Emerson used a lot more traditional theological language than we do in our Unitarian Universalist community now. But his ideas about religion really pushed the envelope back then, and they would still push the envelope today. I think that's what's most striking about our predecessors. In the 1800s, they were saying things that would blow people's minds today. In very broad terms, the essay is about the human soul and a unifying force that Emerson called the oversoul that brings us together. Now, for Emerson, the existence of the soul was self-evident. You can see its reality across cultures and throughout time because it's that part of human beings that longs for a deeper connection. It's the universal religious impulse, the piece of us that responds with awe and wonder, the thing that draws us out of our individual self and self-interest into a broader relationship with the world as a whole. I said before that he used more traditional language than we do as Unitarian Universalists today. And I know some of you, including her, are probably <laughs> squirming at the word soul a little bit. <laughs> now, I find the concept of a soul, at least in that traditional, popular Christian sense, really unhelpful. But that's what's so magical about this essay. Emerson, in 1841, was talking about something so much more compelling than the popular use of the word soul in America today. Our thoughts have been so pervaded by popular religion and culture that we think of a soul as sort of this ghostly existence of an individual person. But Emerson's concept of the soul was more influenced by Eastern religion than our own. Along with the other progressive religious leaders of his time, Emerson was an avid reader of the sacred texts of Hinduism. And the influence of the East was probably most apparent in his description of the human soul. For him, the soul wasn't this ghostly persona of an individual. It was a piece of the divine that's in each person. The soul, then, was something that was the same in each person. It was part and parcel of the same energy that animates the universe. It's not a separate personal identity. The soul is the bedrock of our connection to the rest of creation. His understanding of the soul 
is the seat of the first principle in our Unitarian Universalist Seven Principles. It's about the inherent worth and dignity of every person. There's something within each person, a piece of the sacred that's not earned, it's not in what they say, and it's the same in each one of us. Emerson pretty boldly used the word soul, and I appreciate that. But to understand his concept today, you can just as easily talk about a person's humanity, their potential, whatever it is that's that innate thing in each person that gives them worth and dignity. But we should be clear that this seed or soul or whatever you choose to call it is not dependent on your individual will. It's not a part of an action or even an intellectual activity. It's innate in every person. It reminds me of our meditation that we just sang. Voice still and small, deep inside all, I hear you call singing. It was very clear to Emerson that we each have a soul, a still, small voice within. So what does that mean? What do we do with that chunk that's in there? How does the presence of that soul affect our lives? Well, Emerson thought, and he probably got it from Greek philosophy, that the soul that's in each of us holds this tremendous possibility to illuminate our lives. We have in each of us a piece of eternity, a piece of the sacred. The task, then, is to get into better contact with that piece of ourselves. I talked earlier about the influence of Hinduism. The way we respond to that soul is very much in line with Buddhism. So the great task in our religious lives is to, re to move beyond focusing on our personal ego to see the truer self that lies beneath. Personal ego, all of the stuff that we typically think of as our identity, our bodies, our achievements, our intellects, even our actions, our good deeds towards others. All of the trappings of our personal identity can get in the way of seeing and experiencing the most important part of ourselves. The hymn that probably speaks best to this, we're not singing it today because we don't really have to, we know it so well, would be this little light of mine. Our task is to let that light that resides in each of us shine forth, a light of truth and compassion. The great task of religious life is to keep our personal egos and pride out of the way long enough for that light of truth and compassion to become the driving force of our lives. It's not an easy task, but it's our task. Emerson thought, and I pretty much think, that it's actually the point of all meaningful personal reform and religious movements. We Unitarians have always been in the business of bettering ourselves, doing what we can to improve society in general, and to live with integrity. It's sort of in our religious DNA, this self-development focus. According to Emerson, the real goal of those improvement efforts is to allow the soul to become more manifest in our daily lives and to offer that opportunity to other people. And when we can manage to do that, our lives and their lives are transformed. Not only, they're not just improved, they're transformed. The sort of change that occurs when we really listen to our soul is of a different magnitude, I think. It's not a sense of growth in just one aspect of our lives, 
but rather a transformation of the person. It's like a metamorphosis, I guess. We're not just growing, but fundamentally changing a whole being. When we tap into deeper truths through our soul, it's not an expression of intellect or ethics or just an expansion of one piece of compassion. It's the whole thing changing. You may have heard me often use my one of my favorite quotes from Emerson. Actually, I haven't used it here that much, but it's in the hymnal. It says, It behooves us to be careful what we're worshiping, for what we are worshiping we are becoming. It behooves us to be careful what we are worshiping, for what we are worshiping we are becoming. Emerson saw tremendous importance in the focus of our worship. He saw tremendous potential in each person. The seed of truth, the soul that could come to its full glory when given the right circumstances and nurtured in the right way. So each of us has a soul, and that soul is an instrumental way for us to develop as people. It's also a critical way for us to build relationships with one another. Because it builds relationships between us. One of the most important points to make about the soul here, it's about the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Everyone has a soul, a piece of that divine spark and potential in them, but sadly we all know that that divine spark is not always the easiest thing to see. It's either because that person has so much in the way blocking their inner light, or just as likely because we have so much in our way blocking our own ability to see it. But it's the soul in us that's able and willing to recognize that special piece of another person. There's a sort of mutually reinforcing power when people join together in community, at least when they're brave enough to be real with one another. Our souls gravitate toward one another and bring one another out of hiding if we allow them to, if we encourage it. So in that way, it matters deeply how we spend our time with one another. Being in a community allows us to better bring our true selves into fruition, I think. And it allows us to practice seeing the souls of other people around us. Our souls are enriched by communion with other souls. That's not to say that every encounter with every person feeds us. Quite often we see what we're allowed to see in another person. Not a soul, but a show. Fundamentally, I think that we have this great gift of an internal BS detector. <laughs> That's my description, not Emerson. <laughs> but the core of our being, our soul, is attracted to other people's souls. We innately know the real thing when we see it, and it is humbling and awesome and incredible. The real soul, I mean. It's not proven by material things or physical characteristics or boasting or great intellect. It's a channeling of truth. It's so apparent that we can't help but recognize it when we connect to souls. And coming into contact with that real person reveals all of those other means of self-aggrandizement as the facade that they are. So that seed within us, that light, that potential, that soul, is the piece of us that connects with one another. And Emerson 
said clearly and over and over that it was also the way that we relate to God in the world. That's because for him, the soul was a part of God in each person. It's not that ghostly persona that we often think of when we hear the word soul. Emerson thought that it was something more universal, a piece of the divine, a spark that rests in each person. You can see it and call it just as easily truth or beauty or humanity if you want to use those pieces, those language to embrace the concept. I told you earlier that Emerson was deeply influenced by humanism, and you can see it again in the way he talks about the soul and relating to God. I've told the story a couple of times here from the Bhagavad Gita about a father and son learning this lesson about the soul through salt. There's another story with figs, with fresh figs, but I couldn't find any to use today, so I'll do that in a couple of months when figs are around. <laughs> but the father tells his son, place this salt in water and come to me tomorrow morning. So the son did as he was told, and in the morning... The father said, okay, now bring me the salt out of the water. And the son looked into this pail of water, and he couldn't find it, for it had, of course, dissolved into the water. And the father said, taste it from this side. How is it? And the son says, it's salty. And he says, taste it from the other side. How is it? He says, it's salty, of course. And the father says to the son, look for the salt again and come to me tomorrow. So the son did as he was told, and he came back the next day, and he said, I can't see the salt, I only see water. And his father said to him, in the same way, O oh my son, you cannot see the spirit. But the truth is there. An invisible and subtle essence is the spirit of the whole universe. That is reality, that is truth, and that is you. In Hinduism and in Emerson's faith, each one of us is filled with that spirit. The truth that resounds with the entire universe, also with us. It constitutes our being. I find the idea fascinating and enthralling and you may find it a little bit kooky, and that's okay. So let me put it in Unitarian Universalist language. We talk a lot about our inter interdependent web of all existence here. It's an undeniable reality of life. Strangely, for Unitarian Universalists, that interdependent web means several different things. I think that's why it's such a powerful metaphor for us. It means love and compassion. It's an ecological connection for some people. For some people, it's about social justice and action. So whatever the interdependent web means to you, you plug into that web in a particular way. If it's an ecological web, your body connects with the web. It's about compassion, then your emotional self connects with the web. If it's about service to others and justice, then it's your actions, your doing that connects with the web. So whatever that point is that connects you with the rest of the web of life, wherever you feel it and however you feel most connected, that point is worth some serious focus and study. Because that's the point within yourself that probably has the most to teach you. Emerson would call it your soul. Emerson believed and taught that the soul was the seat of the divine in each person. It was the universal spark that we all share and plug into with the web. For you, the soul may or may not be a spot of connection, but if you get nothing out of today's worship service, I want it to be this. 
that piece of you that makes you feel most connected to the rest of the universe is special. It's the seat of your religious life. Find that spot where you plug in and cherish it. Because it has endless lessons to teach you. We've covered a lot of different ideas today, but before I wrap up, I want to boil Emerson's Oversoul into a few key pieces. First and foremost, a light and source of goodness that rests within each of us is there, it's undeniable, it's universal. And the greatest task, perhaps, of our life is letting that true light shine. Remember, everyone else shares that same light, whether or not they know it, and whether or not we can see it. Everyone else has that same spark within him or her. When you're able to connect soul to soul, light to light, with another person, something magical happens and the world is enriched. So be brave when you can, and share your light to give other people the courage to share theirs. And remember that the piece of you that feels connected to the world, Emerson called it a soul, you may call it something else, but that piece of you that feels connected is the foundation of a religious life. Spend some time there and explore that connection because it holds tremendous lessons that can transform all of us. Amen. Okay.